Hey everybody, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Um, if you look at the notes in front of you, this is Lesson 103, Bible Study for Bereans, November 1936 through January 1937. The thoughts occurred to me that, you know, I, I maybe didn't need to go so slowly through this stuff, the uh, Bible Study for Bereans, but it, it, when I was putting the lessons together, it struck me as important to be able to show how the thinking here is changing over time, okay? So that, that was what I was after. There are some of the articles uh, in this particular lesson that I think we can just sort of say a few things about and skip over because uh, one, one in particular because it's a little bit redundant from what we talked about last week. But we're, we're working our way towards the end of the magazine. I think I only have one more lesson uh, on this if my memory is serving me correctly, and um, only a few, maybe three more lessons before we're going to take a break uh, from this for the summer so I can kind of again uh, retool and figure out what, what else we need to do. Um, I've been in contact, I continue my uh, ongoing weekly uh, email dialogues with Dr. DeWitt about stuff related to O'Hare, we're working on refining an article for the 1940s, as our, we have worked, uh, done a lot of work on a chronology for um, a new chronology for the O'Hareism booklet, which when that's ready, I'll be presenting that to you, and I'll probably wait to do that till after summer. Um, Mike, would you mind kicking that door stop out of that door so we can... Uh, oh, plenty. Thanks. Alright, so we're, we're in this time period. Uh, that we've that I've identified again. This is my terminology as a as, as a towards mid Acts period, and this started in July 1937. And if you look at the first entry here, Bible study for brains, November 1936. It says the listing for the November 1936 issue in the O'Hare Online Library contains the following note from the copyist. In the October 1936 issue, O'Hare said that the November edition would be a message on isms and schisms. I assume this pamphlet was sent out as the November 1936 issue of Bible Study for Bereans. Hence I have given it, uh, given it that title. Due to the fact that we do not possess a hard copy of the November 1936 issue, we refrain from making any specific comments on the November issue at this time. It is true that he publishes a booklet called Isms and Schisms. And he says at the end of the October edition, in an editorial note, that he intends on sending that out as the November issue. So um, I don't see any reason to doubt that. I just don't have in my hands a copy, a hard copy, of the November 1937 issue of the magazine. Sorry, 1936 edition of the magazine. But judging from the editorial note at the end of the, 19, the October edition, it seems reasonable that the November issue, he just sends out a copy of Isms and Schisms to people um, in place of the magazine. Now, what you don't know yet and you don't really realize until the end of the magazine in July 1937 is that O'Hare says that he is under heavy strain. He is constantly being bombarded by um, email, not email, <laughs> sorry, me and mail from the radio ministry and correspondence, not email, that he's having to answer on adi in addition to preaching uh, you know, three or four times a week at, at, at North Shore Church, in addition to whatever editorial responsibilities he has for Bible study for Brands. And so when you see things like him combining two months, like uh, August and September into one edition, or him just sending out a, a, a previously printed booklet in place of I think it speaks to the fact that his workload is quite heavy and he's not able to uh, possibly meet some of these deadlines in a timely manner. Um, of course, I don't know that. That just seems to be educated speculation based on why he says the magazine had to come to an end. So um, that, that's really all I'm going to say about that, Mike. Oh, I, I'm just curious, how did you find that out? Or what are you getting it from anecdotes or? On the inside cover of the last mag, on the inside cover of the not July 1937 edition, it says this will be the last edition of the magazine. 
and it says that that's due to O'Hare's, the heavy strain that is on the pastor, and it cites oh, okay. the preaching responsibilities and also the constant correspondence from uh, things he's getting questions about regarding the radio ministry. So when I see him skipping whole months or combining two months into one, or two months into one issue, it just tells me that he's probably excessively busy and didn't have time to finish um, whatever the responsibilities would have been. So that's that's just a that's just a speculation based on th that point that's uh, in the July 1937 issue. So, moving on into December 1936, in December 1936, O'Hare introduced his readers to a couple of new authors. One of them was Hal Reed, who wrote The Mystery of the Incarnation and the Indwelling Christ. And one of them is Pastor Holtruff, is that how you say this? Holtruff. Holt. Um, penned an essay titled Christ Our Life. So there's a few authors there. Now, just an anecdote about this uh, Pastor Hol Holtruff. Um, According to an email correspondence I had with Dr. DeWitt, he says that Holtriff later uh, entered into Universalism and a bunch of other, um, you know, shall we say heresy, I guess for lack of a better term, about uh, certain subjects after, at some point after this. Um, what, the reason why that came up was... Um, he wanted me, one of the things that we did for the article is we did a, an analysis of every issue of the magazine and who the different authors are in addition to O'Hare and where they're writing and when they stop writing. So we were trying to judge where the um, X-28 authors like Vincent Bennett and Otis Sellers and some of those other authors that we saw, when they stop, when they fall out as far as writing issues, uh, writing articles for the different editions of the magazine. And when I when I gave him my analysis and I mentioned this one here written by Pastor Holtriff, he responded back to me and saying that later he abandoned um, um, Pauline dispensationalism and ended up in other errors. And he was not more specific. He just told me that he, he knew this individual personally. And uh, so anyway, that's just a little anecdote there. The point is, the greater point is, he's, he is introducing some new authors here to the audience. Also in the December 1936 issue, uh, in an article called Born to Die, Charles F. Baker outlines a twofold purpose of God in the incarnation of Christ. And he says the following, To understand the full meaning of the birth of Jesus Christ, with its announcement of peace on earth, necessary to consider it is necessary to consider that birth in relation to God's promise, God's purposes in the earth and those in the heavens, and to understand that we today as members of the body of Christ are related to that birth only in connection with God's heavenly purposes. His birth and its earthly purpose was destined to bring about a government of peace and righteousness upon the earth. <clears throat> but we are not partakers of that earthly hope. We are partakers of a heavenly hope. Our inheritance as well as our citizenship is in heaven, and we are distinctly told not to set our affection upon things upon the earth, but upon things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. The earthly hope and its purposes were indeed announced at his birth, but they have been held in abeyance for the past 19 centuries while God is completing his heavenly purposes. When these are completed, the same one who is the same one who was born to bring peace to earth will come again to earth to complete that purpose. In other words, our appreciation and understanding of the birth of Jesus Christ will depend largely upon whether we have our minds fixed upon an earthly or a heavenly hope. Whether we are a, whether we are expecting material blessings and prosperity or spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Whether we are occupied more with Jesus upon earth as he ministered to the earthly uh, minister of the earthly hope to his people Israel, then with Jesus in heavenly places as we have, <clears throat> sorry, as he revealed himself through the writings of the Apostle Paul, where he ministers as head over all things to the church, which is his body. It is evident that if we have our, our minds set upon earthly things, whether inside or outside of God's earthly kingdom purposes, we are out of God's will for this present economy. In either case, our hopes will be sadly disappointed. For as long as the present dispensation endures, the hopes of earthly peace and prosperity, of material blessings for the people of God, 
and for universal extension of Christ's kingdom must remain unfulfilled. It's very interesting, you know, the statements are interesting on a couple levels. Number one, for their, what their, their theological content. But number two, with the, uh, the backdrop of 1936, as things are ratcheting up in Europe, um, hit, you know, with Hitler and the Nazis, and um, a lot of things happened in 1936. And with this backdrop, he's talking about how, listen, there's not going to be peace on earth until God's plan for this dispensation is over. And he f finally fulfills that, that plan and program that he had with the nation of Israel in the future. So it's interesting to me that the, two, that the concept of the twofold purpose is showing up here in the mid 1930s. One of Pastor Stam's, in my opinion, most important books is a small one that he wrote called The Twofold Purpose of God. Um, and it elaborates a bit more fully upon some of these things that Mr. Baker is uh, outlining here in July 1936. Um, any questions or comments about that? This next section, uh, on page two, another important article from January 1936 is A Reason for Hope by J.C. O'Hare. In this essay, Pastor O'Hare teaches that Paul was a steward of the mystery long before he was imprisoned for its proclamation in Acts 28. Furthermore, O'Hare argues that members of the body addressed in Paul's post-Acts epistles were saved and made members of the body of Christ during the Acts period. Now, we are not, I'm not going to read all this, okay? We spent all last Sunday talking about that exact thing. This is just a further elaboration on stuff that we spent a lot of time talking about. I just read you that, my sort of comment there so that you know what that's about. And if you want to read this, uh, this lengthy quotation, which goes on for all of page two, Page, and page three, I commend that to you. Okay, I don't, I don't see any reason for us to uh, go over that exact same ground again in that regard. Okay, again, I think we've, I've said it two or three times at this point. What Mr. O'Hare is teaching, again, is that the body in the Acts period is the same as the body in the post-Acts period. That Paul knows the mystery or aspects of it during the Acts period. Um, and, and so on. And that's basically what he's saying there in those two, that lengthy two page quotation. So that brings us into page four. And uh, Bible study for Bereans then January 1937. The Judgment Seat of Christ by Charles F. Baker is the most important article from this edition of the magazine. In this essay, Pastor Baker uses the book of Philippians to argue that the body of the Acts period is the same body of the post-Acts period. Now, we are going to read this one because the argument is different from some of the ones that we've seen so far. Okay, So, first paragraph in the quote, the principle common to all Paul's epistles of the judgment of the believer's works for rewards is just one of the many evidences that in all of them the same body or church is addressed. So, let's stop there just for a second. So what he's going to do here is he's going to make an argument that that's the same body in all of Paul's epistles now, not based on the gospel, not based on what they were believing for their salvation like we've seen in past weeks, but upon the issue of the judgment seat of Christ and the judgment of believers' works. So he's going to, to kind of make a, same, a similar point ultimately, but he's using a different way of getting there or making a different argument. So... Back to the quote, the principle common to all of Paul's epistles of the judgment of the believer's works for rewards is just one of the many evidences <clears throat> that in all of them the same body or church is addressed. Philippians, a prison epistle, gives proof that believers after the Acts had the same expectation as they did during the Acts period. From, until the, fir uh, from the first day until now, Philippians 1.5 and were thus instructed along with the Corinthians and Romans that they must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. God began the good work in them in Acts 16 and was going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.6. The, the Corinthians saved later had a similar hope that they, were, that they would be presented unreprovable in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, before and after the close of the Acts, Paul was pointing believers towards 
the same day of reward and manifestation. See also Philippians 1, 10, 2, 16, and compare with 1, chapter 1, verse 4, with 4 verse 1. 4 verse 1, sorry, with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. Philippians 3, 8 to 14 is the strongest portion of the epistle uh, for rewards in the day of Christ. Paul is speaking of gaining, winning, attaining, obtaining, and pressing toward the mark or the goal unto the prize. Failure to recognize the true character of this passage has led some to very some has led to some very foolish speculation. Some have Paul here striving and working for salvation after he had been preaching for 20 years that no one could ever get it by works. And others try to make us believe that although saved, Paul was not yet in the body of Christ, but was striving to get in. If this be true, then members of the body, members of the body, that membership in the body is not by grace, but by works. And if Paul was not sure, then how, then who dares to presume to have merited? Then how dares? Who dares, who dares to presume to have merited that high calling? Paul also, sorry, Paul, I cannot read today. I apologize. Paul was not here speaking of himself only, as though he had a different case. Was it, he had a different case from others? For if a new body began after Acts closed, every Philippian along with Paul needed to be transferred to, to uh, transferred to it. Besides, after the after telling them for what he was striving, he immediately said, "Brethren, be followers together of me." Okay, so the point here is slightly different. Okay, he's still fundamentally arguing that the people saved before Acts 28 are in the same body as the people saved after Acts 28, but he's not making this argument based upon um, the gospel in Romans 3 and 4 and the gospel in Ephesians 2. He's making it now based upon the idea of standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Both the Corinthians, the Romans, and the Philippians are all instructed regarding this, uh, is the point that Mr. Baker is making, and therefore he's concluding that they are all therefore in the same body. Pastor Baker also addresses the Acts 28 notion of the out-resurrection in Philippians 3.14, and as one might expect, he does not accept this view as being viable. Quote, <coughs> The attaining unto the resurrection, Philippians 4.11, and the prize, or the upward calling, Philippians 4.13, claim special attention. This word resurrection is literally out-resurrection occurs only in this verse. Many interpret it to mean a resurrection prior to another, one group of dead raised out of a whole company of the dead, although this thought is, su is uh, sufficiently stated in the words that follow, out of the dead. Whatever it is, it must be admitted that it is to, that it is to be attained by works and that Paul was striving for it and told the Philippians to do likewise. It could not be that resurrection which will be the lot of every believer, for Paul could not have missed that if he wanted to. It is hard to believe that God has set aside His gracious purposes in the unity of the body and will raise the especially meritorious members of the body in a special resurrection. In the light of Hebrews 11.35, Certain of the Hebrew saints of old age are going to receive a better resurrection, which seems to refer not to a separate resurrection, for they will all be raised in the first resurrection, but to a special place of honor in that resurrection. Now, since the out-resurrection is spoken of as a prize to be attained by some who are raised out of the dead, it seems only logical that Paul, by the Spirit, coined this word to describe the special place of honor in the body which some will attain unto. If this, if this view is correct, then it, harmonizes with, uh, then it harmonizes this passage with the entire Pauline revelation upon the subject of revelation, reward, grace, and membership of the body. Thus the upward calling, uh, which is the hope of the body of Christ, has a prize attached to it. Evidently now all members of the body will receive that prize. This reward is not to be attained by merely giving mental assent to certain dispensational teachings, as some today are asserting, uh, and as some are even claiming that only those who acknowledge their particular brand of dispensationalism will get into the body. 
This prize is won by suffering and being conformed to his death. May God help us to press forward as Paul, uh, as Paul did toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God. Now, look, if you're reading between the lines, he's really he's, he's going after here some of the Acts 28 brethren and their teaching uh, with regard to this particular subject. Okay? So, again, he's making a different argument here than what we have seen O'Hare or Baker make before, previous to the January 1937 edition. And he's saying that the passage there in Philippians 3 is not a special resurrection, but it's dealing with attaining a reward at the resurrection. Which is a different teaching, obviously, than what uh, specifically Welch and to a lesser degree, Bollinger were teaching at that, uh, had been teaching. Welch, obviously currently with 1937, Bollinger has obviously been dead by this point for over 20 years. Um, but you, you, you definitely get a different flavor here of, a, of, of the argument. Another important article from the January 1937 issue of Bible Study for Brains is Peter, Paul, and the Circumcision by J.C. O'Hare. In this essay, O'Hare addresses the twofold nature of Paul's Acts ministry. In addition, he talks about the revolutionary nature of the book of Galatians in terms of teaching regarding Gentile salvation. Quote, During the Acts period, Paul was becoming a Jew to the Jews to gain the Jews. But after the nation was given up by the Lord in Acts 28, 25 to 28, Paul seized his twofold program. This is clearly set forth in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. In his post-Acts ministry, Paul declared, Paul declared for special, Paul declared for spiritual circumcision. For we have the circumcision which worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3.3, 3, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him, buried with him in baptism, wherein also, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Colossians 2, uh, 11 and 12. Yes, he also declared for spiritual baptism not made with hands. The question that continues to present itself is this. If Galatians were written before Paul's experience recorded in Acts 21, 18 to 28, how are we to reconcile Paul's submission to the urge of James and the Jewish brethren to prove that he, Paul, had not instructed Jews to give up circumcision uh, with, those words, with those words of Paul in Galatians 6.15, For in Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Paul's teaching was revolutionary teaching. This revolutionary teaching, and such it was when Paul first presented it caused much commotion, controversy, separation, and bitterness, just as water baptism does today. Paul declared it to be the gospel of the uncircumcision given to him by special revelation from Christ in heaven. Peter and the other original apostles got the truth concerning this from Paul in person when he visited them in Jerusalem more than 14 years after he met the Lord on the way to Damascus. Galatians 1, sorry, Galatians 2, 1 through 4. Again, we would urge you to see the importance of this. The result, Peter, James, and John gave their, sec gave their uh, sanction and hearty endorsement to Paul's unique ministry, the gospel of circumcision for the Gentiles, and they gave to Paul the right hands of fellowship, Galatians 2.9. But, th but, but did this change their ministry? Not at all. They went right on with the gospel of the circumcision for Israel, for Christ had so instructed them. Two gospels are mentioned in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Only one is for this dispensation. This revelation from Christ to Paul was one of the mysteries given to Paul. That Gentiles were to be included with Israel in the Abrahamic covenant was no secret. But it was to be on grounds of circumcision and in Israel's kingdom program in which the Gentiles were to, be, were to be subject to the circumcised Jews. But Paul in Galatians gave out the information that a different program has been revealed by Christ, namely that before God restored the kingdom to Israel, the same gospel of grace that was preached to Abraham in uncircumcision was preached to the Gentiles. 
Instead of being blessed with Israel's kingdom blessing, Gentiles were blessed with faithful Abraham, being declared righteous without the deeds of the law and without any religious ceremony or ordinance, justified without a cause by God's grace. The uncircumcised Gentiles that believe are to be one in Christ with the uncircumcised Jews which believe. This was indeed a secret that had been that had been made. Sorry, this was indeed a secret that had to be made known by special revelation, by the pen of Paul. The uh, the question for believing Gentiles to be or not to be circumcised was settled. Settled, yes, but not accepted by many prejudiced legalists and religionists. By the same pen, the question should be settled today as to believing Gentiles to be baptized or not to be baptized. But alas, other prejudiced legalists and religionists are here to oppose this blessed truth. If Colossians 2.11 settles physical circumcision, then Colossians 2.12 should settle physical baptism, be a Berean. As the religionists of Paul's day were circumcised, uh, as, sorry, as the religionists of Paul's day were circumcised to take away the offense of the cross, religionists today take away the offense of the cross with water baptism, uh, which has nothing to do with the gospel of grace. So, again, this is, again, touching on some of the stuff we went over last Sunday with the questions that um, you asked and that I was feeling and trying to answer about some of the things that were going on during the Acts period, okay? So... O'Hare is saying without a doubt that Paul cannot write the book of Galatians if he doesn't know what? The mystery. The mystery. Okay? He cannot write about Jews and Gentiles in one body unless he understands some things about what God is now doing dispensationally during, during his Acts period ministry. And so that's the, that's the bigger point here that O'Hare is trying to make. Um... Before we go any further here on page six, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Still now in the January 1937 issue, <clears throat> in Far Above All Heavens, Charles F. Baker defends the notion of two future spheres of blessing. One, the millennial earth, pertains to Israel, and number two, the heavens, pertaining to the body of Christ. This teaching is defended against the notion that the body will experience a different future far above all heavens. So again, here, here, here's the arguments that he's making are sort of directed towards some of the Acts 28 teaching at that, that was going on at that time. According to Pastor Baker, this notion, this notion is rooted in the Acts 28 notion that those in the prison epistles possessed a different hope from, from believers during Paul's Acts period epistles. Quote, Christians, generally speaking, believe that there will be two places of future blessing for God's people, namely heaven and the millennial earth, or the new heavens and the new earth. Recently, however, a teaching has been put forward by some that this is only part truth. Listen, for they claim that the members of the church, which is Christ's body, are bound neither for a new earth nor a new heaven, but for a third sphere, which is far above all heavens. Going to that place, of course, is supposed to be much better than merely going to heaven. The writer is always willing to give what the writer is always willing to give what he has for something better. So he eagerly searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. The search was somewhat simplified since the theory demands that those addressed in Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Thessalonians, and Hebrews are bound for heaven, and the other ones in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Timothy, and Titus are, uh, belong to an altogether different church or body and, and were on a road to an altogether different place which is far above all heavens. In other words, the theory of the three spheres falls down if it can be proved that the same body of believers is addressed in all Paul's epistles or that believers in all are bound for the same destination. So, you need to see what's happening here, okay? Is there any doubt 
that for a time in the night in 1935 that that O'Hare and Baker were gravitating towards Acts 28 view. No doubt. Okay. We've observed that in January 1936, there's an abrupt shift away from that. Okay. And then from that time period, they start to write articles that are critical of some of the key tenets and beliefs of what the X-28 teachers had to say, all right? And as time goes on, the argument, and the more these men have studied the issues, the more complicated their responses are getting to what they perceive to be the errors within those, uh, within those other teachings. This teaching is founded upon only one verse of Scripture in reality, although other verses are mustered to support it. That verse is Ephesians 1.10. He that ascended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. The expressions on high in chapter 8 verse 1 and heavenly places 1.8, one eight, sorry. All right, eight chapters in Ephesians. <laughs> and heavenly places in Ephesians 1.3, 1 1 1.20, 2.26, 3.10, 6.12, are supposed to describe this place far above all heavens. Christ is supposed to have ascended into heaven just prior to Pentecost and to have remained there as high priest, advocate, and intercessor until the end of the Acts period. And then to have left heaven and to have ascended up far above all heavens, the word translated heavenly places in Greek, compound, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Greek name there, uh, but he's saying it's a compound word composed of upon plus heavens that is therefore supposed to, is therefore supposed to means the place which it, uh, which is upon the heavens. The following ten points of inquiry have caused the writer to conclude that the Bible does not uphold this new theory. Now, look at these ten points. I didn't, I didn't include all of them because it just would have taken too long. Although as I look at the clock right now, and having cut out uh, a whole two pages of the notes, I realize that I'm way ahead, of, way ahead of schedule. So maybe I should have included more of them. But again, I'm going to link to this on my website. And if you want to read this yourself, this is available for free uh, for you to do so. So, as alluded to at the end of the above quote, Baker provides 10 points to justify his conclusion that this theory is incorrect. Time and space will not permit us to recount all ten points. Consequently, we will quote some of Baker's more important points as well as his conclusion. Interested parties are encouraged to consult the free electronic version of the document available on the O'Hare Online Library. So, of the ten points, I want to <coughs> look at points nine, ten, and then the conclusion that uh, Pastor Baker makes. <clears throat> By the way, I should also point out that by this point, the two primary writers of the magazine are O'Hare and Baker. The rest of them that we saw early on in the 19, 1935 have pretty much all dissipated as far as contributing articles. The few small, the few times we see somebody like Hal Reed, it's only once, I believe, in the entire two years that the magazine was running. And this magazine, by this point, is essentially Baker and O'Hare's magazine. O'Hare has his name on it as the editor, but the two guys that are writing the articles are O'Hare and Baker. Okay. Um, Dwight and I were discussing this point, and. He said that it reminds him of Luther and Melanchthon, which I thought was an interesting, uh, an interesting comparison from church history of how the, the, the relationship that these two guys clearly have um, with each other in what they perceive to be refining of, of, of truth, at least in their minds as they see it. Um, so I'll just throw that out to you. I, I think it was an interesting comparison. Point nine now. In of his ten, talking about why 
his, the theory of being ascended above all heavens is a different hope and so forth in the post or in the prison epistles as opposed to what is being discussed in the Acts period epistles. So point nine. The next significant fact <clears throat> is that it is not stated in Ephesians that we are going to be in the uh, uperion, that's a Greek word, in the life to come, but that we are seated there now. Christ is now seated at the right hand of God, and we are seated there in Him. But Christ is not going to sit forever on His, father, on his Father's throne, but only until I make, my enemy, make thy enemies thy footstool, Hebrews 1.11. We know that He is going to leave that place where He is now seated and return to this earth. He is going to take His own throne and reign, and Paul states in his last epistle that if we endure with him, we shall also reign with him. Even after the millennial reign upon the earth, we know the body of Christ will be in the new Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if I agree with him about that, okay? But this is what he's teaching at this point, so we've got to understand it for what it is. It is unthinkable that the body of Christ will be left in one place while the head is in another. And if the body will be with the head then it is evident that the body will not be in the same place which the head is now bodily seated. So understand what he's saying. Number one, he's saying that Christ is already seated where? At the right hand of God, far above all heavens, and that you as a believer are already identified and seated with him positionally there when? No. Now. Okay? Then he's further saying that Christ, is not, that Christ will not remain there, that he is going to stand at some point to return back to earth, Okay, and so he's 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 making it. He's trying to prove that idea wrong by identifying those two concepts that are one of which is already true now, positionally of every believer is already identified, seated with him, and at the right hand of God in heavenly places now. And number two, the fact that he's not going to remain there. Uh, point ten. <coughs> the last important point to be taken into consideration in this discussion is the relation of the body to the bride. Since those who hold the three spheres theory also hold that the body is not the bride, this argument is valid. Dr. Bollinger in his book, The Church Epistles, wrote, so he's quoting Bollinger, Christians, in their usual selfishness, attempt to rob others of their place as the bride and thus lose their own still better place as part of the bridegroom. Thank you. Another quote now. Uh, what is clear and certain is that the church is that the church is the body of Christ Himself, and that the members of that body in Christ, mystical, are part of the bridegroom and cannot possibly therefore be the bride or the bride herself. Assuming that Dr. Bollinger is correct. One can see the queer picture that the three spheres theory presents. It is claimed that the bridegroom is, so to speak, going to be living in the penthouse, while the bride will be living far below on perhaps the ground or the ground or second floor. If the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that the husband and wife are to cleave together and that they are one flesh and one body. And surely any teaching which separates the bridegroom from the bride is unscriptural. If an election of Israel is the bride, and we are part of the bridegroom, then it is clear that we are not made one with the bride to be in the same place in which the bride will be. Now that's a lot of, you got to think about that, um, and what he's essentially saying. Now what's interesting there is, if you pick up on it, is he saying Bollinger is wrong about identifying about the church not being the bride? Let's look at it again. He says, assuming that Dr. Bollinger is what? So he's not saying categorically that he disagrees with Bollinger's teaching about the church not being the bride of Christ. He's just saying that if Bollinger is right, it doesn't make any sense to then teach this 
super on high calling as opposed to just the heavens, is what he's essentially arguing. But he is not saying here categorically that he thinks necessarily that Bollinger is even wrong about identifying Israel as the bride and not the church. Um, I have a book at home too, Pastor Don Chrysler, Bud's dad, wrote a book called um, The Paul's Commission or something like that. It is, and he's got a, I have it underlined, he's got a sentence in there where he's talking about a conversation or a meeting that was held uh, by some of the pastors in the GGF, and I don't remember what year it is, but that they, but that Baker was involved in that and that they concluded that the church was not the bride of Christ. Okay? So that's maybe a little bit of backdrop of me reading into that, but he, even if you read that statement, he does not say that he disagrees with Bollinger about the identification of the bride. What he does say, though, is that if Bollinger's right about that, it doesn't make sense to teach this other thing over here about the, there being this super on high calling, and you get the reasons for why he thinks that in, in, in the article. Now, obviously, I only gave you two of them and the conclusion, which we're going to read here in a minute, but he does go through all ten points or reasons why that view doesn't make sense to him. Okay? Before we get to the conclusion here, are there any questions or thoughts about any of that? Didn't, didn't O'Hare, in his earlier writings, still refer to the body as the bride? Yes. And uh, there, already Anderson had it in print, though, a long time before that, that he did not believe the yeah. body. So it must have been a pretty fluid... Uh, Discussions about that. At that Bo time. Yeah, Bollinger had that in print. Anderson had that in print, and there were. And I, I'm per, I'm almost certain Welch probably had that in print um, before January 1937. And that that definitely is an aspect here that these guys are discussing, and I think that they continue to discuss it for some time after 1937, as far as you know what what they who they identify the Bride of Christ as being. Um, so yeah, I wish I would have brought that book in and I would have showed you that statement. I'll have to, I'll have to dig that up and bring it in maybe next week. Um, yeah, if, if you want that book, you should talk to Bud. I think his dad's selling it for like three bucks or four bucks or something. I, it's not a ton of money. It's is it in the? Um, you might even look in there. I don't know if you put a copy of that one in there. One or copy I bought. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> I, paid, we, I, I, I gave. I gave uh, I paid nine bucks for it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pay. I didn't pay anything because I got the manuscript. It was even he hand, Bud handed me the. Um, it was a piece of paper just like this. I didn't get the fancy one. All right. So conclusion. It's important to keep in mind. Now remember, this is Baker's conclusion here to this article. Baker. Yeah, this is Baker's article. Not O'Hare's. Okay. So we, yeah, ever since page I, I saw, I saw. six, we've been talking about Baker's article here. Okay. It is important to keep in mind that the scripture plainly teaches <clears throat> that there is more than one heaven. There is the heaven of heavens, Second Chronicles 2, 6, chapter Deuteronomy 10, okay. Um, which may or may not be what Paul calls the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. The tabernacle was a type of the heavens. Hebrews 8, 5, Hebrews 9, 1, 5, uh, 9, 15, 23, and 24. And no doubt, its three, its three parts, courts, holy place, and holiest of all, correspond to the three heavens. If so, the three heavens are not separated anymore are not separated any more than the parts of the tabernacle were separated. The holiest of all is the third heaven, where the throne of God is. When Christ ascended far above all heavens, Ephesians 4.10, we are not to suppose that he went into a place outside of the heavens. For Paul's prison epistles directly state that he is in the heaven, but that he has but that he was given an exalted position of power and glory above all beings in the heavens, or as Scripture says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Above, in the same sense, as he is exalted above the heavens, every name. Philippians 2.9 
and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named. Ephesians 1, uh, 20 and 21. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Colossians 1, 18. It is just another way of stating the headship of Christ. He is now head of the church, which is his body, and in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God is going to literally head up all things in Christ. Heaven is many times used for the inhabitants or powers of heaven, just as we say that Maine voted for Landon, meaning inhabitants of Maine. Meaning inhabitants of Maine. Roosevelt, however, was elected, and he is now exalted by reason of his position above the United States. His being above his being above is one position and not is one of position. Yes, is one of position and, and not or place. Of place. Of place. It's a typo there, huh? Not one. Uh, <coughs> he is ab he is above weather in South America or in the lowest latitude in the world in much the same manner. I believe my Savior has been exalted above the universe. And no matter where he may be locationally, he will ever keep that exalted position. <sighs> so, kind of a little wordy there at the end of that, but um, I think you generally get the point of the argument that he's making. Okay. So, we see here again that these, in my opinion, you're free to disagree if you want. They are, they, O'Hare and Baker are driving this, this sort of think tank, if you want to look at it that way. That's going on. O'Hare is in Chicago. Baker is in Milwaukee. They are corresponding with each other. They are um, working together. And they are definitely bouncing off ideas off of one another and, and refining what it is that they're teaching here. Okay? Um, and they're becoming increasingly more organized, but increasingly more... Um, Descript and concrete in the arguments that they're using here as they are again working their way towards a, a dispensational position. They are not Acts 2, they are not Acts 28, they're somewhere in no man's land still in January 1937 trying to figure out where they think the church began. Okay? So, any questions about any of that? No? Mike? Oh, um, in, in Philippians 1 6, the day of Christ, don't, what did you say that was again? Um, I know you covered it in your your, your seminar, but. Uh, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I wish I had my notes. Just a short definition. <laughs> I know there's a little controversy yeah. in there. Last week's notes? No. Uh, yeah, the day of Christ. Um, the day, the day of Christ is a Pauline term that only Paul uses. The expression the day of the Lord is found in prophecy. And what we said last March is that the day of Christ includes a series of events that pertain to the body of Christ. The rapture, the judgment seat, uh, different things occurring as it relates to the body of Christ. Okay? And uh, so the rapture will be included in the day of Christ. So just as the day of the Lord is a, it's not a day, like a 24-hour day, it's an elongated period of time um, that includes the millennium and then out, out uh, into the uh, new heavens and the new earth, so, at, so the day of Christ is a, an elongated period of time that includes multiple events. And in Paul's thinking and teaching, that would include the catching away of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, it would eventually include the installment uh, of the body of Christ into the heavenly places and so on up here. And then eventually we said that when the day of the Lord comes to earth, that the day of Christ, uh, I got the, the dotted line here would be the day of the Lord. Okay. We think the day of the Lord begins in the middle with the war in heaven. Satan and his angels fight against Michael and the, and the dragon and his angels and so forth. And the, Satan and his angels are kicked out of heaven. 
vacating the principal, vacating the heavenly places, the body of Christ is installed uh, up there. The day of the Lord, then, this dotted line comes down to earth at the second coming. The day of Christ, this solid line ends here because it's at this point that the stuff in First and Second Thessalonians about God punishing the enemies of the Thessalonians is executed on earth here at the second coming, but then the day of Christ continues on out here uh, into the future. Okay, so the day of Christ is a multi, includes multiple events, just as uh, related to the body of Christ. Just as the day of the Lord includes multiple events related to the execution of God's plan and purpose with the nation of Israel. Now that's the short summary. There's a the booklet is out there, and you probably still have it. And there's a color-coded chart in the back of it that outlines and explains this. Yeah. Uh, that was just a question. We we are placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. At the time of salvation. Mm -hmm. um, were believers prior to Paul in, the, in Christ. In the sense that they're saved, yes, but they're not in the body of Christ. Body. You can't, they're not, that verse that you're referring to, I believe, in Romans is a verse that anti-dispensational teachers will often use to try to disprove dispensation. Well, I, yeah. I ran across this verse during the week in, yeah. in my reading and uh, it raised a question. In my there's, mind. there's no salvation for anyone in any dispensation, ultimately outside of the work of Christ. Right. Because Paul explains that to you in Romans three. He talks about how. Uh, why don't you turn to Romans chapter three? He talks about how God dealt or looked at sin in time past. Romans 3.24 Romans 3.24 Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That's how we get saved now, today in the dispensation of grace. We'll look at verse 25. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are what? Passed through the forbearance of what? So God for built forbear to for well, what's the word for bore? For bore? Babe? Bore? I don't know. But anyway, he he dealt with, he allowed the blood of bulls and goats to cover sin annually for the nation of Israel, knowing that at one at some point the propiti the propitiatory blood of Christ would be offered. Right? So what Paul's doing there is he's explaining the fact that even somebody in the Old Testament that died in faith. The only way their sin can truly be forgiven is through the, ultimately through the shed blood of Christ. So, any, so nobody gets saved from any age or any dispensation apart from the atoning work of Christ. So he's not talking there in that verse about being placed in, in the body of Christ. It's just about that, we're, that all believers are in Christ of all ages. The only way, about the, the only way you can be a believer is that you are ultimately identified with Christ. Now, don't misunderstand me though, Fred. I'm not saying that, uh, I don't know, King David was trusting and believing that Christ died on the cross for his sin and rose again as the only payment for his sin. Because David at that point doesn't... David doesn't even really know, know anything about that necessarily. Nor do the twelve apostles during the earthly ministry of Christ. Because when Peter first hears from the mouth of Jesus in Matthew 16 that he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die, what's Peter's reaction? Oh, praise the Lord, thank God you're going to die for my sin? No, it's... Not so, Lord. Not, be it far from me, Lord. I'm not going to let that what? Happen to you. And Christ says to him, get thee behind me, what? Say, say, say. Okay. I've, always, I've always heard it taught that believers before, or people before the cross were saved by looking forward to the cross. Believers afterwards were saved by looking back to the cross. But but 
like you say, they they didn't have all the information, but they by faith they were. I would say they were saved by believing what God told them to do. Okay. Yeah. So if, and I this is an easy illustration, right? If God comes to me and says, "Build an ark," yeah. can I go out and by faith build an ark? Not today. Not in this dispensation. But if God tells Noah to build an ark, how does God judge the faithfulness of Noah? Like the fact that he obeys God and goes out and does what God says, right? So faith, what saved the individual in time past was what they were placing their individual faith in. Like Abraham believed God and yes. it to him for righteousness. He believed God about the promises that God gave him. And he him. believed that while he was yet uncircumcised. That's, that's Genesis 13. He's not circumcised till chapter 17. Okay? And so what O'Hare is making an argument about in the, some of the stuff we just read is that God provided a means of justification for us, uncircumcised Gentiles, simply by believing God in what He did with Abraham back there in Genesis 13. Now, that, this gets kind of complicated, but it, that, that's basically what he's saying. Yeah. Um, an interesting concept that goes along with that is that believers of all times aren't so much saved by their own faithfulness or their works ever. It's because they believed this phrase, God himself is my salvation. And that, in fact, is what the name Jesus means. God himself, our, our salvation. I know that because um, of naming my son Joshua and um, finding out what the word Joshua means and that Joshua and, and Jesus... Yeah, and Joshua is related to the it's Hebrew. The same, it's same yeah, Hebrew the Greek word, word Jesus. <coughs> and, and, and the word means God himself, my salvation. What dispensationalists argue all the time about how people in time past were saved. Okay? Some believe... Stam even teaches that works play a part in their justification. Others believe and hold that they play no part in justification and that God only always saved people by, whether, by, by faith. So these arguments have, are ongoing. They, in some cases, are quite hot. And um, they're... There, there, there's certainly, um, in my, from my vantage point, no resolution in the minds of some people about these things. Where I stand is essentially with this principle. I think faith is believing what God tells you to do. Okay? So if John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the twelve apostles are preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel of the kingdom says, repent for the, time is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel, and he tells them to be water baptized. I do not believe that simply going and getting wet saved them. Okay? But I also, in saying that, understand that if they're going to have faith in what that message is, they will do what? Be baptized. They will be water baptized. Because that is, that is the message that God is teaching for them in their age, in their time, and their faith is going to be their faith is going to be judged with respect to how they respond to that message. Okay, that's the way. Maybe that's an oversimplification. I don't know, but I, I also see way too much overcomplicating on some of this stuff on the part of others. Um, so anyway, Fred, it's, it's obedience to the faith as or faith involves then obedience to. What you believe, right? I, mean, I would, for instance, you, you use the example of Noah. If he would have believed God's instructions, but not have gone ahead and built the ark, he would have died. That's right. right. Yeah. Or if Abraham had believed God said, he told him to go, leave his home and go into a new land, but he said, "No, nah, I don't think I'll do that. I'll just stay here." He, he, that wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been obeying what, in other words, his faith, their faith had to have some feet to it. I agree. Yeah. Well, 
actually all human actions are based upon what we believe. Um, period. I mean, everybody, whether they're whether they believe in God or not, everything we do is based on what we think is true, um, and and we are just simply active in life. Um, back in the garden, though, the first the the, the temptation of Eve was it, it wasn't so much eat something forbidden. It's God is lying to you and does not mean you good. And, and so for a time, she believed Satan instead of believing God. And, and, and after that, they knew they were naked, and they attempted to cover themselves. But when God came and rescued them, they believed him and allowed him to clothe them. And um, those are basically the two choices, believe God or don't believe him. Yeah, and... It, I, I think that's right, and if you look at what happens in Genesis 3, he starts off by questioning, and then he flat out denies what God said would happen to him, claiming that he knows better, and she buys it. Yeah. And then the first, it, it, it <laughs> what's the first thing Adam and Eve do when they realize that they've sinned? Try to hide. And they go and they, they try to, they through a religious work of their own effort, they try to cover their own sin by making themselves an apron. And God comes to him and he says what? No, nope, that's not going to do. And so he comes over here and he sheds the blood of an animal to create a skin of clothing for them out of that animal. And from there on, you have the precedent that's set that the only thing that is going to cover your sin until the sacrifice of Christ can be made is shed, shedding of blood. So all that is all that was in that. But anyway, we gotta quit now. Somehow we always manage to fill the time, whether it's through your questions or what have you. So thanks for your attention and we will come back next week to continue.